Despite the importance of women in missionary work, in one letter she said, some years ago the Southern Methodist mission in China had run down to the lowest watermark. The rising of the tide seems to have begun with the enlisting of the women of the church in the cause of missions. The previously unexampled increase in missionary zeal and activity in the Northern Presbyterian Church is attributed to the same reason, the thorough awakening of the women of the church upon the subject of missions. Understand that Lottie Moon inspired the formation of the Women's Mission Union, the WMU, and that is an independent uh, society that does not participate in the um, Southern Baptist Convention because they're not allowed to because they're women. <laughs> they actually were formed in, in the basement of, of another denomination because they weren't allowed to meet in a Baptist church. Isn't that amazing? They didn't get a vote. And yet they were the ones who were raised up by God in order to stir up the hearts of all the people in the body of Christ for missions and indeed to go themselves. This has always been the case, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what I want to show you. Women have always led the way when it comes to missions, when it comes to proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed, Jesus set it up this way from the beginning when the very first people that he told to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ were a, a group of women. And he told Mary, he said, go and tell Peter, even Peter, the leader. Okay, of these men that I've chosen, tell Peter what to do. He said, go tell him to go to Galilee and tell him I am risen. The most important message that has ever gone forth. It was first proclaimed by a woman and Jesus Christ set it up this way himself. It has been this way from the beginning. It will be this way to the end. It has been this way in prophecy. I just read to you um, Psalm 68, 11 through 12, which prophesies an end times army of women who will proclaim and publish the word of the Lord. It says the word of power goes forth from the Lord and great is the army of women who proclaim it. This is what we have seen, right? Interestingly enough, the next verse says that the men in the camp, they divide up the plunder. Wow, look at that prophecy, you guys. Can you imagine? Isn't that exactly what's happening right now? We're seeing that the women have gone out, they have proclaimed the word of God. And then the, the men want to come in and say, it has always been God's will for us to be the leaders. Well, guys, if you want to be the leaders, you need to get out there. And that's what was frustrating Lottie Moon. The men didn't seem to want to come and do this missions work. In a letter, she said, Recently on a Sunday, which I was spending in the village near Pingtu City, two men came to me with the request that I would conduct the general services. They wished me to read and explain to a mixed audience of men and women the parable of the prodigal son. I replied that no one should undertake to speak without preparation, and I had made none. I'd been busy all the morning teaching the women and girls. After a while, they came again to know my decision. I said, it is not the custom of the ancient church that women preach to men. I could not, however, hinder their calling upon me to lead in prayer. Need I say that, as I tried to lead their devotions, it was hard to keep back the tears of pity for those sheep not having a shepherd, men asking to be taught and no one to teach them. We read of one who came forth and saw a great multitude, and he had compassion on them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And how did he show his compassion? He began to teach them many things. Brethren, ministers, and students for the ministry who may read these lines, does there dwell in your hearts none of the divine compassion which stirred the heart of Jesus Christ and which led him to teach the multitude many things? Now, isn't this an amazing letter? And this is kind of towards the beginning here when she's, um, she's first dealing with her womanhood in her missions work and she's still believing the lie that had been perpetrated by the mistranslation of about two or three verses that said that women couldn't teach men. And she was trying her best to obey both the traditions and the theology of the men that were leading, which said men have to be in charge of every woman. Every woman has to have the headship of some man. And the calling that was obviously moving her the spirit that was forcefully moving her into missions. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that when God's spirit is upon you, when God's spiritual gifts are poured out into your life, it is a living spring of water. One of the prophets described it as a fire burning in his bones. And he said, you know, I tried to be quiet. I tried to sit over by myself and just lock it up and not say anything because everybody hated my guts every time I'd preach the word of God. I didn't want to speak it. I tried to pin it up but it was like a fire burning 
in my bones. In the bones of this woman who was called by God was burning such a compassion for the people who are coming and saying, please give us this life-giving word. These men that were coming to her and saying, I want to hear the word of the Lord. She was so moved by the spirit of God that it overcame her traditions. And yet she was still hesitant. She felt that maybe even she was doing something wrong. What a travesty. What a tragedy now that we look back in history and see how significant this woman's work was. And who can deny what Southern Baptist male leader can stand up and deny the significance of the work that this woman did among both women and men? Would they take away her work? They would take away that part of her legacy if they could, but they can't change the fact that she still indeed is undeniably a woman. And she is the one who has done all these things in the name of Jesus. So Lottie was not the only one who was frustrated with the fact that the men didn't seem to have the guts to go overseas, that the people that were going were generally women, and it was harder for the women, especially in the societies in which they were ministering, which were also, you know, about putting women under their thumbs. They would shut the women into high-walled houses. They didn't let them go out in the streets. It was generally looked uh, down upon for them to go to church, uh, for the for the women to really go out in public. They were kind of held in shame, and um, they were not honored in that society. What a travesty, again, that instead of showing that the kingdom of God is a different kind of kingdom and being salt and light on the earth, that instead um, that the very denomination that she was trying to faithfully serve was uh, exemplifying the same exact kind of bondage uh, against women that the world was. But the reality is that when you go into the mission field, you do need men to go in there because often the men won't listen. Now we see that sometimes, obviously, they would. They would even come seeking her out because people are so thirsty for the word of God. We need men and women working together. And that is the message of Jesus Christ. That's the body of Christ working together. The Bible says that a divided house cannot stand. So when men and women are divided, our house is divided. You know, when uh, when husbands and wives are divided, when brothers and sisters are divided, and when we can't seem to tell the difference between those relationships, things get really mixed up. They get really messed up, ladies and gentlemen. But in the body of Christ, we need to be able to work together as brothers and sisters in order to reach everyone. She wasn't the only one who was frustrated with this. Um, I'm going to read to you part of a blog post, a few excerpts from a blog post. This is the uh, blogger William Thornton. His uh, title was Young Male Restless Conservative SBCers Sniveling Wimps. Ouch. Not my words, you guys. He says two-thirds of the personnel who serve in the International Mission Board's Journeyman program are females. Let's see. Southern Baptist churches give over $300 million to our international board to reach the world for Christ. An important and significant part of their mission force is a two-year program for single college graduates and married couples without children. The IMB describes it thusly. For the past 40 plus years, more than 5,500 adventurous young college graduates have served all around the world as journeymen missionaries. These Southern Baptist 20-something single or married with no children college graduates wanted to do something more after graduating than just jump into a secular career. They wanted to be on mission with God. Apparently, far fewer of our finest male college grads are very adventurous. Two-thirds of those serving in the journeyman program are females. It gets worse. Many of the priority locations for these personnel are in countries where males are culturally dominant and females highly restricted. So God must have willing males to bridge this cultural divide, right? No doubt God does, apparently just not among Southern Baptists. It's the, quote, willing males who are deficient in the SBC, not God. Most of us are aware that the Southern Baptists are mainly responsible for the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. The CBMW makes news primarily in the area of pronouncing what females cannot do in ministry positions or reacting to such things. It goes on to say, I would recommend that the CBMW refocus at least some of their energy on biblical manhood and relax on the womanhood business. Perhaps they could get funding to supply spiritual testosterone to the young, restless, educated males in the SBC so they would step up to the task of the Great Commission somewhere other than church-saturated Fort Worth, Texas, Reformed Hotbed, Louisville, Kentucky, and elsewhere. 
I ask, is God calling only females to these places overseas? Surely not. If he were, it would be the Almighty's joke on the Southern Baptists who disallow females as senior pastors, but use them for the more significant service overseas. Surely a young man entering the SBC pastoral ministry, where he will likely serve single staff, mostly rural churches for his career, and where he will be dealing with a people group who are gospel saturated, could at least consider that God may call him to one of the many people groups elsewhere virtually without the gospel. At the very least, the IMB should rename the Journeyman Program to the Journey Woman Program or just the Journey Program. Lottie Moon, could you send us some more strident and pointed letters from the foreign fields and address them to the young men of the SBC? Now, I know that that stings, but you guys, what are you going to do? You're going to criticize those of us who understand that these people are dying and going to hell and we're going to do something about it because God has called us to do it even though we're female? You're going to criticize us? Jesus said, take the the log out of your own eye, man. Go and do what God has called you to do. Then you're going to have a little bit more appreciation for what it means to sacrifice for the gospel. Women do it every time they decide to take up the mantle, almost every time, because they automatically, immediately come under much more pressure and criticism than men do. Okay, this was an update by William Thornton on the same post in November of 2014. He is uh, commenting on why he used the term sniveling wimps in that past post. He says, here's why. You can't get these guys to go overseas and serve the Lord in some of the more difficult places where the gospel is needed the most, but you can get the girls to do it. In 2012, fully two-thirds of journeymen were females, not males, making that program the most inappropriately named program in the entire SBC. Here's a recent comment I received. I've tweaked it a bit. And the commenter says, I'm a girl about to start my journeyman term. And let's just say out of the 30 or 40 single people being trained, a figure that includes journey people, apprentice, and career appointments, there are five single guys. It is way harder for girls to go overseas single than guys. And way harder for single girls to come back from overseas still single. The places in the world that need the gospel need male witnesses desperately. And so many things single women can't do in so many other cultures, especially in some parts of the world where the need for the gospel is the greatest. The excuse of the single males is that there are other things to consider. Those men clearly don't follow Jesus in a way that puts trust or faith in him. William Thornton goes on to say, Hey, single guys, yeah, you biblical he manhood and subservient womanhood types, here's a bit of womanhood that should make you ashamed of yourself. You want patriarchy? Try being a real male and being open to serving in places as hard as this girl. Even if you do, you will have it easier than her because of the male-dominated cultures in these places. Nobody cares how well you conjugate Greek verbs and how gloriously expound the scriptures. Evidently, you haven't expounded the Great Commission sufficiently for you to believe it for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand, when we're talking about preaching the gospel, we're talking about eternal life and death of souls and how easy it is to sit in our comfortable pews, how easy it is to sit in our comfortable lives knowing the gospel, knowing the truth, knowing that we have an assurance of eternal life in Jesus Christ and be lazy and complacent. How easy it is without strident leaders who are going to stand up before us and say, hey, listen, it is your job. It is our job. It is not just, you know, the chosen uh, few domineering, dominating men that God has chosen to lead the church. Whoever is willing to sacrifice themselves in love to take up their cross and follow Jesus, that is your leader, according to Jesus Christ. And I would say um, to William Thornton that I, I don't necessarily think men should be ashamed that women are exceeding them, that women are excelling and going beyond what they're doing. Understand that women are made in the image of God every bit as much as a man is. And I know that you've got theologians that try to dismiss the Bible, but you know, in the Bible, in Genesis, it says, that the image of God is a married couple, Adam and Eve. Jesus tells us that God is a father of whom Jesus is an image and a spirit that gives birth. So you see an image of that in Adam and Eve. This is really simple stuff, you guys. It's only hard for theologians. So understand, he told both of them to rule the earth, and they do it side by side. They are counterparts. Help me, it's a, a really bad translation, okay? Women were not made as an accessory for a man, but someone who is opposite and counter to and helping them. And the same word for helper is a word that is used of God. 
and the fact that he is our helper. So before you look at women and say, oh, well, you know, these men are supposed to be ashamed. And I know Mr. Thornton is saying that because they're holding themselves up to be superior. And that is true. But the truth of the matter is that whoever among you is exceeding you in love is your leader. And they are not leading you in order to shame you. They are there leading you to show you the way. And if you are running this race, you should run, as Paul said, like you want to win the prize. If somebody is exceeding you in love and sacrifice, you better run harder, you better run faster, and you better thank them along the way for giving you that urge to go on for uh, pioneering and cutting out that path for you, going ahead of you and showing you that there is something more than your comfortable pew.